This is a blind tasting. <laughs> oh, this is uh, this is uh, this is an, an interview with uh, with bonus. Okay. Well, you say bonus. I mean, my producer Mareka has made some cakes, and she's used. Have you really? <laughs> They're madeleines, so tiny little cakes. Some of them are made with sugar. Some are made with substitutes. And I just wanted to crack them out and see if we can tell the difference between them. Should I get a plate to put this on? Actually, I'll be back in the three, three seconds. Hello, and welcome to Crowd Science, <laughs> the show that tries to eat cake on the BBC's dollar at every opportunity. I mean, endeavours to find answers to your science questions. I'm Marnie Chesterton, and I promise you, that plate of sugary treats isn't just for fun. It's actually an experiment we'll come back to. Because today's episode investigates some people's love of sweet stuff. When I was... A child, a baby, I was given hot tea with sugar in in my bottle and drank a Ribena, this uh, a fruit juice, with an extra two sugars in, my sister and I. It sounds sickening and disgusting now looking back. For those of you not familiar with Ribena, it's a blackcurrant cordial, popular with children and already pretty sweet. Adding sugar seems crazy to me. But listener Trevor does seem to have a very sweet tooth. And he's wondering why, especially because his wife, Asha, doesn't. Yeah, I used to have a um, sweet tooth, but now I can see that I don't need sweets or sweet food so much as I used to in the childhood. So when you do get your sugar hit, how do you like sweetness in your diet? I usually go for uh, dried fruits like dates or some apples, pears. I love fresh fruit. You know, I still love uh, cake, so I tend to replace white raffinated sugar with brown sugar or xylitol because I've read that especially xylitol or stevia, they contain like 50% less um, calories than white sugar. Trevor, do you find xylitol to be an acceptable alternative? I think if it's mixed in with other ingredients, then I've become used to it over time. I still do like white sugar in, in cakes and chocolates and biscuits, and it's a great battle for me to, to cut that out. I want to know how much sugar I personally can have to stay healthy. I, I seem to need a lot more than my wife, but how can I find out what's a safe level? Do you have any inklings why you might have more of a sweet tooth? Well, I was wondering whether it's simply to do with upbringing that I'm just used to having high sugar, but I just don't know whether there's a hormonal or a genetic component there. Because some people tend to have a few cakes and they suddenly put on huge amounts of weight or get diabetes. And other people eat sugar their whole lives and never get fat. It does feel unfair. The World Health Organization recommends that we eat a mere 5% of our diet as added sugar which seems hard to swallow if you're one of those people who can shovel in sweets and stay slim and healthy looking. But looking healthy may not tell the whole picture. As Trevor says, too much sugar is a major factor in diabetes and heart disease and can also ruin your teeth. He and his wife are both fit and not overweight and they want to stay that way. So how strict do they need to be? And are the alternatives that Asha mentioned, sweeteners like xylitol and stevia, are they good substitutes for traditional white sugar? Do they even taste as good? Let's go back to those cakes. They're made with a variety of sweeteners, and there's a real sugar version too. We thought we'd test them out on Professor Giles Yeo, geneticist at Cambridge University. One of them looks nice and golden and very appetising, I want to point out. This one's over here, for whatever reason, look a slightly different colour. They're slightly lighter. And there's some that look green. What kind of sugar colour did you use and why did it look green? Giles studies how our brains control our appetite. So, can his brain pick out the real stuff? Look, I'm going to go with green first. <laughs> Brave. <laughs> Brave man! He's picked a cake sweetened oh, by like stevia. Green. It comes from plant leaves, hence the colour. It's also 300 times sweeter than I, sugar. I don't know if I like get as much. Sugar also has a particularly satisfying mouthfeel that substitutes can't quite match. Well, it's not unpleasant, but it's almost savory. I can taste butter. Mm. Mm. It could be sweeter. I'm sorry. This should... 
Marika might hit me with a microphone. <laughs> and we both homed in on one cake in particular. Yeah, this, this is the golden one. This is the one which looks most appealing to me. Oh, this one smells good. It's very nice. And I think this one was made of sucrose. Do the reveal. Oh, God. You see, this is, this is why I'm not a gambling, gambling man. I was right with the sucrose. Ah, they're glucose. And then the question, well, if they're all sugars, why do they actually taste different? And the surprising thing is, as it turns out, the glucose one tasted the least sweet because glucose is not actually that sweet. It's, in fact, the loveliness of sugar comes from the fructose element. Broadly speaking, sugar is anything chemically with the word O's at the end of it. Glucose, fructose, dextrose and lactose, which is found in milk, are all sugars. There's even sugar in mushrooms and DNA, called ribose. But what our listener Trevor is interested in is sucrose, the stuff that comes in little sachets with tea and coffee. And it's made of one molecule each of glucose and fructose. Glucose by itself is about 70% as sweet as table sugar. But for our bodies, it is the sugar, the stuff that our cells power through as they keep us alive. And the fructose? Well, that's what makes sucrose so delicious. And Giles explains we're hardwired to seek it out. Just put little drops of sweetened liquid into the mouths of young mammals, including babies, and you see that face going, ooh. And the reason is because as a baby mammal, your goal is to avoid becoming tiger food. And that means eating foods that are easily accessible, easily absorbable, high in energy. And the closest thing is milk, which has fat, but also has sugar. So the, the, the drive to get something sweet is innate in us to make sure we love it, love it, love it, to make sure we drink as much as possible, to grow as quickly as possible. The key thing, however, is the only time in life that we naturally drink our sugar is when we're babies. We're designed to eat our food, not to drink the food. When we eat something, our mouth chews and our body is primed to begin to receive calories. When you drink your calories, sugar in liquid form is absorbed very quickly because there's no digestion. I want you to think of a lovely, juicy, plump, sweet orange. Fructose may sound like a fruit sugar, and yes, it is found in ripe fruits. But in our orange, most of the sugar is actually sucrose, which is then broken down into glucose and fructose, as we mentioned earlier. So if you eat the orange, you chew and saliva is released, which sends a message to your gut to prepare for some calories. Your body has to work to get hold of those sugars because they're bound up in fibrous orange segments. Now, if you squeeze the orange and drink those calories instead, the body is hit with a lot of easily available sugar very fast. Once it's broken down and absorbed into your bloodstream, the glucose can be used by every cell in the body, but fructose needs to be processed by the liver. If a lot of it comes all at once, the liver converts it into fat. How much differs from person to person. Clearly, we are evolved to eat sucrose. And our liver is evolved to handle fructose to a certain level. As with most things in life, the dose makes the poison. Okay. okay. And I think we've got a situation where if you have too much fructose, then you actually have a problem. Now you're going to ask me the question, how much is too much fructose? That depends on the individual. How have scientists had a look at that? This is actually some work done by my colleague in New Zealand, Professor Peter Shepard, in which you have a fructose tolerance test. Okay, so in other words, you take a given amount of fructose, it goes into the body all the way down, and then the bugs that are there ferment what's left. But if you absorb it at a different rate, there's more of it around, the bugs then ferment it, and hydrogen gas is given off. Big breath all the way out. This is a clever way of showing that different bodies deal with sugar at different rates. School kids drink 25 grams of pure fructose, then exhale into a breathalyzer, a bit like the kind police use to test possible drunk drivers. So you're blowing into the machine, it's giving you a reading of hydrogen, and that is supposed to give us an indication of whether your bodies are good at absorbing fructose or not so good. Prof Shepard, and I actually work with him on that, studies the susceptibility of the indigenous population of New Zealand, the Maori, to obesity, but particularly to type 2 diabetes. The communities there, they enjoy fizzy drinks, okay? And so there is a question here on whether or not one's propensity to absorb fructose drives 
a desire for more sweet food to actually drink it? Or if you don't absorb enough of it, does it then drive you to eat more of it in order to absorb more fructose? So the answer is we don't know. It is a useful way of sending it out to kids or, or adults for that matter to say, well, what is my likelihood of absorbing fructose? Does it put me at higher risk of loving sugar, so therefore eating more calories, so therefore linking to obesity or diabetes, etc., etc.? Unless you're diabetic, the ability to absorb glucose seems roughly the same for all of us. But when it comes to fructose, some people are much better at absorbing it than others. Less is left in their gut to become fermented into hydrogen, which means more ends up in the liver. Maori communities tend to have high rates of diabetes, so how much of this is down to genetics, processing sugars with different efficiencies, and how much is down to a culture that exposes you to more sugar in, say, fizzy drinks, it's tricky to unpick. Giles Yeo and Peter Shepherd would like to know whether the people who are good at absorbing fructose are more likely to crave sweet stuff in the first place. And so far, it's not clear. In humans, that is. In America, scientists have discovered genetic variations in mice that give them a real sweet tooth. My name is Danielle Reed, and I'm the Associate Director of the Monell Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia. We have a couple of famous mice that drink the same amount as their own body weight. So if you take a 30 gram mouse, it's drinking 30 grams of sugar water every day. So these mice love sugar. And we have found genotypes that seem to affect how much they like sugar and how they use it for calories. Now, the missing link here is we don't understand how these genes might work in humans. And that's something that we're really keen to understand better. I'm imagining these mice as the comedy fat ones, are they? <laughs> well, not necessarily, no. So we certainly have a lot of mice that are huge uh, lovers of sugar and that are also very active. They kind of remind me of adolescent boys. You know, there's there's not a strict relationship between the mice that are loving their sugar and how fat they get. These mice just seem to love, love sugar, but they seem to do okay with it. There are probably multiple genes and, you know, obviously variants of these genes that act on making sugar feel better when you eat it or making it more desirable to people. So the gene might regulate how fast it hits your bloodstream. So it might create the absorption, might be absorbed really quickly and you get that feeling of that sugar rush, if you will, right away. Whereas other people might have a gene that doesn't allow them to absorb it. And the other thing is it may go into your muscles faster, so it allows you that quick energy so you can run or sprint or do what needs to be done, whereas other people would be less able to use those sugar calories. Listener Trevor wondered why some people seem to be able to eat as much sugar as they like and not put on weight, and it does seem that genes play a role. Genes are also responsible for another group of people who are much more likely to get fat if they have too much sweet food. Giles Yeo was part of a team that discovered that around 1 in 300 of us have a genetic mutation that stops us feeling full at the right time. These people tend to be up to 17 kilos heavier by their 18th birthday. So, yes, our liking for sugar is built into our DNA in multiple ways. One of which, Danielle says, is a matter of taste. One of the things we know is that people's tongues are really different. And the number of papillae we can see on our tongue is a very rough guideline to how many taste cells individual people have. If you're near a mirror, go and stick your tongue out. You'll see lots of little raised red bumps on the end of it. These are called papillae, which is Latin for nipple. And these tiny nipple-like structures contain a cluster of taste buds. Each taste bud contains a bunch of taste receptor cells that recognise sweet or bitter or sour or salt. And some people have more of them than others. We give people various concentrations of sugar to taste. We see what's the lowest concentration that they can taste sugar. And we also ask them how much they like it. And what we see there are that people are remarkably different in what their preferred concentration of sweetness is. You can probably guess what's coming next. More taste tests. I wouldn't say no if offered a cookie, but sadly this isn't as good as a cookie. 
However, it is a neat way for Danielle to show me where I sit on the sugar appreciation scale. Okay, well, let's start you with zero. Lined up on the table are four glasses of clear liquid, which I'll taste in turn. Why don't you go ahead and take um, a full mouthful of zero. That's water, until I get to the last one, which is unbearably sickly. Oh! <laughs> oh. Mm. Mm. I've got to spit that out. The last solution that you tasted is 36% sucrose. And believe it or not, that concentration is highly preferred by about 20 to 25% of people. Wow. If you're making a fizzy drink as a manufacturer, you've got a conundrum on your hands. Yes, and honestly, when we do this test, we don't go higher than that last concentration, but I suspect that there are people in the world who would like something that's even more syrupy than that. Do you know Iron Brew? No. Iron Brew is Scotland's national drink. It's not like anything else I've tasted. It's bright orange, it's incredibly sweet, and the government in the United Kingdom introduced this sugar tax. And so suddenly there's this massive incentive for manufacturers to try and take sugar out of their products. And so they came up with a new recipe for iron brew. And nine out of 10 people said it was absolutely fine and they didn't notice any difference. And one out of 10 people panicked so much about their preferred product being taken off the shelf that people started hoarding this stuff. Yeah, so I mean, it really proves the case that on a grand scale that there are some people who just really not only prefer it, but they really feel very wedded to it and are very disappointed uh, when they don't, they don't get it in the form that they're expecting, absolutely. We've quickly established that I'm not someone with a sweet tooth. Even the glass with just 12% sugar was too syrupy for me. Danielle explains this could be down to the sensitivity of the sweet taste receptors in my tongue. There's an A form of the sweet receptor where people are very sensitive and get along fine, and then there's a B form, which is harder for people to perceive sweetness, and so they just need more to get to the same place. So that's sort of the sensory part of it. And then the other thing is that there's genetic differences in how people feel after they have sugar. I really like sugar, but it's not good for me. I get a headache. It makes me queasy if I drink too much sugar. But there are other people where even lots of sugar and lots of sweetness makes them feel great. And do our preferences also change with age? I mean, I remember being a kid and like really loving frosted cereals. And now I just can't do it. Yes. When you just compare kids with adults, kids on average prefer that higher sugar concentration. So kids seem to have a higher need for calories for growth. And we think that this changes the pleasurableness of sugar. We did an experiment where we measured the children as they were having growth spurts, so how fast their bones were growing. And we found that They had the peak preference for this very high sugar concentrations about the time where their bones were growing the fastest. And so you can imagine that on an evolutionary time scale, you know, when we had to work really hard to get sugar, climb the tree to get the honey, whatever, sugar was really a prized thing for kids. And so they were really motivated to find some. So it's really been a a transition to a different lifestyle that's caused the sugar-related problem. The A form or B form of the sweet taste receptor. It's a bit like your blood type. You're born with one or the other and that doesn't change. So that's the nature. But what about the nurture? Trevor also wondered whether his upbringing and all that sugar his parents added to his sugary drinks affected his sweet preference. We're essentially born being able to taste sugar, but eating is a very personal experience. It's very much time and place. We can all imagine all of the desserts and the things that brought us pleasure in childhood really have a strong tug at the heartstrings, and those things cannot be discounted. You were just making the the beautiful example of this Scottish drink, which frankly sounds diabolical to me, bright orange and full of sugar. But, you know, you said 10% of people have a real attachment to it. And I don't think that's all genetic. I think part of that is uh, time, place and environment and learning. Now, our listener, Trevor, 
really likes sugar. He has cut down, but even when he does eat it, it doesn't seem to be doing him too much harm. I mean, could it just be that he might be able to tolerate more sweet things than the rest of us for all of those reasons? Yeah, so this is really a new frontier in nutrition recommendations. It's going to be tailoring the recommendation to the specific person. Now, the safest thing to do is to reduce sugar to whatever the World Health Organization has. I think it's 5% of calories at the moment. But the, the bigger question is, is that an appropriate recommendation for everybody? So for Trevor, who's got a sweet tooth but is uh, fit and healthy and seems to handle it well, does he really need to be cutting down to that extent? That's the question that people are really trying to understand by looking at these large-scale populations and to see if we can start making more specific recommendations for specific people. I think it's a more compassionate view of the world, so it's able to not shame people for liking sugar and maybe finding who can and who cannot safely consume it is the next step forward. You know, the problem is, is when what we've learned about our own bodies from all of our daily experimentation, when that comes up against uh, recommendations that don't match. So the Trevors of this world wondering if it's truly okay for them to eat as much sugar as that they'd like to eat. The answer may be yes. This is Crowd Science from the BBC World Service, and we're trying to find out why our listener Trevor can't stop reaching for the cookie jar. We've heard how a preference for sweet stuff is built into us from birth, but that our genes, environment, upbringing, and even the size and shape of our tongue will determine how much sugar we can handle in later life, along with how good we are at extracting energy from it. While researchers like Danny and Giles are trying to understand our body's relationship with sugar, it's become clear over the past century that when humans live in a world with plenty of delicious sweet things to tempt us, many of us become fat and unhealthy. It's no coincidence that over that same 100 years, a huge industry has sprung up, trying to develop products with that sweet, sweet taste, but without the calories. Although, fun fact, the artificial sweetener saccharin was made accidentally in 1897 by someone looking at coal tar derivatives. And aspartame, found in most diet sodas, was also an accident, produced by a chemist looking for an ulcer drug. Happy accidents, given that there is big money for the company that can finally crack replicating the authentic sugar taste – Annoyingly, our mouths are very good at detecting the excessive sweetness or chemical tang in some of the alternatives. Jim Carr is Director of Global Ingredient Technology for food giant Tate and & Lyle and explains there's a lot more to sugar than simply sweetness. We can think in, in confectionery products uh, of having a browning or a golden colour from sugar as it's cooked. We can think in a biscuit product of crispiness or in frozen desserts Sugar actually reduces freezing point and you have less frozen water present or ice present and that gives it that smooth texture. Without sugar, you have something that's quite icy and a bit unpleasant. And of course, just its kind of, its bulk makes up something of the recipe that it's involved with because we tried to make cakes using stevia, which is 300 times as sweet as sugar. And so you're looking at replacing 300 grams of sugar with a gram of something. And and uh, producer Mareka and I were thinking, <laughs> how do you do that? Where's the cake? Right. In beverages, of course, you can use uh, high intensity or high potency sweeteners. And it's quite straightforward. But in a product like a biscuit that might be 30% sugar, when you take sugar out, you're right, your biscuit becomes a uh, one third smaller. So you have to replace, we call it sometimes the bulking properties of sugar. Traditionally, food manufacturers have bulked a product out by adding fibre or other ingredients, but it can mess up the recipe. And so Tate and Lyle turned to the natural world to find a very clever solution. In nature, there are a, a wide range of different types of sugars. There's cane sugar, or lactose, fructose, and then uh, dextrose or glucose. But there's also quite a number of rare sugars. Some of these rare sugars have very unique properties. And allulose is one of those rare sugars. It has uh, virtually no calories. Allulose is found in tiny quantities in figs and raisins. But in the 1990s, scientists worked out a way to make it commercially from corn. 
It's the same size as fructose and even has the same chemical formula. But because the body doesn't recognise it as a sugar, it can't be metabolised and used for energy. So it's excreted. But what's most impressive about this rare sugar is what it tastes like. I think we're going to start with the breakfast cereal first. And given the selection of low calorie goodies lined up before me, it seems rude not to try them. You do immediately get quite a sweet hit from, from that. Jim talks me through a range of products, from a cereal which only has two grams of sugar, well, that was delicious, to a sports nutrition bar, and finally, a meringue. As you crunch into this, you'll see the sugar-like uh, characteristics that we're trying to replace are all there. It has high sweetness, and I think you'll see it has this delicate melt-away texture that, uh, again, as far as challenges go, very, very difficult to do without something like allulose. While you could do a straight swap between sucrose and allulose, it's still mainly used alongside other sweeteners. But with things like caramels, which tend to be made up of 80% sugar, even replacing half of that with something else makes a big difference. For diabetics or people who absorb fructose very fast, it may prove a game changer in terms of how much they can safely consume. So far, allulose is only registered for use in a handful of countries, and in the US, Tate and Lyle have been permitted to market it as a sweetener, which most medical professionals agree is the best way to cut down on calories. But all of this assumes that sweeteners have no effect on our metabolism if they don't contain calories. New research is starting to challenge this opinion. So CrowdScience heads off for a chat with one of the people at the forefront of this field, Dana Small. She's a professor of psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine and she's become something of a thorn in the side of the diet food industry. I had done some work with PepsiCo and I believe they were very well intentioned and sincerely wanted to reduce the amount of sugar in their drinks. And so we were running experiments to try to do this and we had an unanticipated result. When I showed them the, the finding, they dropped the research budget. They cut us off, they cut our funding off, and uh, they thought that I was dangerous. Dana doesn't come across as particularly dangerous, but her work on the body's response to artificial sweeteners is considered by some to be controversial because it turns well-established scientific principles on their head. Generally speaking, the amount of sugar in a food is related to how sweet it will taste and how sweet it tastes also serves as a prediction for your body to know how much energy it should expect to absorb. That means if you eat a biscuit, when your tongue tastes it, your taste cells send a message to your body to prepare for calories by releasing insulin to deal with the expected increase in blood sugar, or glucose. The standard idea was that when you eat sweet things that don't contain energy, your body can tell the difference and it doesn't respond with that message saying, unleash the insulin. Dana wanted to test this theory, so she gave healthy people one of three equally sweet drinks. In one group, they consumed a beverage that was sweetened with sucralose. So there was sweetness but no energy. In another group, they received a beverage that was sweetened with sucrose and had energy. And then the third group had the sucralose, but it also had calories because we added maltodextrin, which does not bind to taste receptors in the mouth, so you don't taste it. But when you swallow it, it turns into glucose. Then she measured the participants' blood sugar, or glucose, levels. And while nothing changed in the group that just drank the sweetener, when it was consumed alongside a carbohydrate, she saw really surprising results. If you take away the power of sweetness to predict energy by uncoupling it from energy, then it should be the case that sweetness becomes an unreliable predictor and therefore the body listens less to it. However, we found that the group that had the sucralose and the maltodextrin showed increased levels of plasma insulin. And so what that means is that they had to secrete more insulin in order to maintain blood glucose levels. And that's a classic sign of glucose intolerance. And glucose intolerance is the pre-state to, to diabetes. Right. So diabetes is essentially deficits in the ability to control glucose. 
And so we found that this very minimal uh, manipulation resulted in not diabetes or even prediabetes, but just a movement of the success of the body in regulating glucose towards the direction of intolerance. So you've got three drinks. One has real sugar, that sugar is absorbed. One has low-calorie sweetener, which has no effect. But in the third drink, with both a low-calorie sweetener and a tasteless sugar, the metabolism of that sugar is upset. I don't want to confuse you here because there are multiple words floating around for the same thing. Maltodextrin is that tasteless sugar, which Dana used so that all the drinks would taste as sweet. It's also a carbohydrate, like all sugars, and it seems that carbs, when eaten alongside the artificial sweetener sucralose, disrupts the brain's calculation of how much energy it's going to receive. So what's going on here? Well, Dana has a theory. First, let's talk about taste receptors. You may think you taste stuff in your mouth, but that's not the whole story. One possibility is that there are taste receptors, in fact, distributed throughout the body. Taste receptors in the mouth cause us to sense sweet, but those same sweet receptors are in the stomach and in the intestine. Those receptors are important for regulating glucose absorption. Now, you taste that drink in your mouth and again in your gut. And in this second tasting session, your gut receptors don't seem to like the mixture of some sugar and some sweetener. In the gut, the taste receptor activation tells other physiological systems that there's actually twice as much energy present. So the message that would be sent would be to absorb twice as much glucose as is actually present. Dana thinks the brain learns from this mismatched message and tries to adapt for the next time, recalibrating how much energy will come from that level of sweetness. Let's say now I'm actually consuming a real sugar. Since the last time I had that amount of sweetness, there was only half the energy I expected. This time, I'm going to expect less energy. And so the absorption will be slower and potentially other mechanisms that are important for metabolizing the sugar will be reduced. So our research suggests that having your diet drink by itself in the afternoon should produce no ill effects. However, if you consume your diet drink with a bagel, that will actually be more harmful to you. Do you think it matters how much artificial sweetener people are consuming? This one is, is hard to answer because in our study, the amount that people consumed was actually pretty small. And yet we saw significant effects. I think that, you know, probably small amounts are not going to do anything harmful. The problem comes in when artificial sweeteners, because they're less expensive than real sugar, start being added to all sorts of products so that sweetness can be increased without adding energy. And so more and more foods that you don't even realise have artificial sweeteners in them. This is really fascinating, but I imagine it's also controversial, right? Because the general consensus when it comes to sugar is that it's the calories in the glucose that are the problem. And if you don't have the calories, then that's much better. Yeah, I mean, that seemed like great wisdom. And that's why people developed artificial sweeteners in the first place. But as it turns out, when you manipulate foods, you change the way the body processes them. And so what started off as a good idea has had unintended consequences that instead of being healthful are actually harmful. You know, we're not going to go back to the Garden of Eden where everybody is eating organic food again. So the only way forward in order to feed the population is to make foods that are respect the rules of metabolism. Uh, the problem is, at this point, we don't know all the rules. So that's why I think science is so important. So far, Dana and the other groups doing these studies have only looked at the sweetener sucralose. But they're interested in others. No one has yet rerun this experiment with the many combinations of different sweeteners and sugars, so, of course, they don't know what would happen. Tate and Lyle's head of nutrition told us that while the company agrees sweetness is an area that would benefit from more research, on low-calorie sweeteners, there is a large body of peer-reviewed clinical evidence confirming they don't cause blood glucose spikes, 
which is why expert groups like Diabetes UK, the American Diabetes Association and national health authorities in the UK, US and elsewhere recommend them for people with or at risk of diabetes. Something I've heard from every scientist on this topic is that we need to know way more about how our bodies react to foods. And in the meantime, we all still got to eat. So for Trevor and Asha, listeners who wanted definite answers on the safe amount of sweetness in their diets, the answer is, it depends. Genes, environment, activity and age will all affect the answer. And in the future, we'll probably tailor our meals much more to our individual biology. And if that all sounds a bit like science overreaching itself, here's Giles Yeo to put it all in perspective. Is it better not to have the sweetness? Possibly. But, and here is the big but here, if you're having too much sugar, if you are diabetic, if you're trying to wean, in inverted commas, a child of sugar, could sweeteners be used as a middle ground, as a step away? Yes. We can survive without the white powdered stuff, for sure, because we can get it from eating bread and pasta and potatoes. But where's the joy in life? <laughs> that, that would be what that would be what I what, what what I say. We've come to the end of this edition of Crowd Science. This week's episode answered questions from me, Asha, and my husband Trevor. It was presented by Marnie Chesterton and produced by Moeka Peters. If you want them to tackle a subject you're interested in, you can write to the team at crowdscience at bbc.co.uk. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.